Chapter 28 Magic Lantern Part 1 The morning of Cornfest dawned, warm and birdful. Johnny sat in Aunt and Bearclaw's kitchen with his hands wrapped around a cup of steaming chicory. Sleep had refreshed him, but trouble still lurked in the quiet of his mind. Burly Man thought I was dead, and you knew the exact day I would return. You set a place for me at the table. How did you know that? Aunt flapped two more pancakes onto Johnny's plate while Chestnut danced pirouettes to the yellow sun streaming in through the window. On the stove, the kettle began to whistle. Bear Claw replied, Oh, Burly Man, he has more things he wants to know than the things he knows. Don't get me wrong, the man's heart is good, but he's driven by something that won't let him relax. You've seen it. You know what I mean. That doesn't tell me how you knew I was coming. Aunt sat down and rested her head on Johnny's shoulder. We heard it in the strings. In the strings? Jocko heard it first. We were playing the harvest in Archer's Bale, and he stopped right in the middle of the old red hen, and he said, Johnny's coming. I can hear it. After that, we started hearing it too, a little louder every night. And last night, when we finished practicing, we all looked at each other and we said it together. Tomorrow. He's coming tomorrow. Of course, Frankie had his own ideas on the matter, said Bear Claw. Something about wavelengths. He read it in the electricity book. The air is full of wavelengths vibrating at different frequencies like the strings of a guitar. You, can, you can't see them and you can't feel them, but he thinks you can tap into them if you have the right kind of instrument. That be our instruments. They picked up your wavelength. Of course he was drunk, said Aunt. That he was, replied Bearclaw. He was in the long hall last night when we left asleep at the table. I suppose we should go there now and see if he's still alive. They finished up the pancakes and Aunt cleared off the dishes. Bearclaw asked Aunt to stay with Chestnut while they went to check on Frankie. Chestnut threw herself on the floor. I want to go see Frankie. No, baby, said Aunt. You need to stay here and help Mommy sew the birds on the bonnets. Bearclaw and Johnny walked out in the meadow toward the log house. Already people were gathering, milling about, setting out their wares. Mummers were practicing their mummering. Jugglers their juggling. Frankie's not the same man anymore, said Bearclaw. He hardly ever lives in his house. He calls it a laboratory now. He got that from a book. We found him three more books, me and Jocko, out in the vaults of abandoned ruins. One was about engineering, another was chemistry. The third he never reads. It's called A Critique of Pure Reasoning. The doors to the log house were open. Inside was commotion. Big kettles were set out on almost all the tables, and a cauldron of water boiled over the blazing fire in the massive fireplace. Scullery workers were bustling about, 
Tom Cleaver the butcher stood in the open scullery door, rasping a knife on a sharpening rod with such vigor that sharp sparks leapt from the blade. The air was close and moist and smelled of blood. Frankie was the only person sitting at a table. He was propped upright with a wool blanket pulled around his shoulders, staring blankly at the light through the open door when Bearclaw and Johnny entered. Frankie leaned forward and squinted as if he were looking into a cave or an open cupboard. I've been here all night. His voice was hoarse and rumblesome. Why didn't someone carry me home? We were tired, Frankie. It was late. Besides, you're a grown man. You can carry your own self home. Frankie slitted his eyes. It looked like he could only open one of them. Who is this man you brought here? Don't you recognize him? It's Johnny Arcane. We told you he was coming. Frankie straightened his back, folded his hands. That's not Johnny Arcane. Johnny Arcane is a boy. This is a grown man I see before me. Johnny couldn't tell if it was a smile that broke through the distortion of Frankie's face. He felt a wave of sadness, seeing his friend in such a state of disrepair. He sat at the table and covered Frankie's clasped hands with his own. I've grown a bit, he said. Frankie nodded. I see. And I have sacrificed some. But for a cause. Your cause. I have no cause. My cause was to save Lucy. I saved Lucy. Frankie rang his, ran his tongue over his gums as if to find the words there. He stared into Johnny's face several times. He shaped his lips as if he meant to speak, but finally his mouth sagged into resignation he turned to Bearclaw. Pull me up now. Take me home. I have something to show Johnny. The man was heavy, and he hung limp as they held him under their, his arms. Johnny and, and Bearclaw on either side. His crutches were nowhere to be seen. He smelled terrible. Outside, with the sun shining on his face, he began to mumble incoherently. Yesterday, he said, I broke through. Level 17, trebled. Trebled energy, no time. On the meadow, the party was starting up. Banners were being raised and drummers were drumming. Scullery workers had carried one of the big kettles out onto a table piled with flowers. From the cow stables, Mayor Burley Man looked up to see the two men dragging the one-legged man through the crowd. He raised a leafy wooden staff in salute just as they disappeared around the stalls. The first thing Johnny noticed on entering the laboratory was a low, steady hum like a string continuously vibrating. All the shutters were drawn and the room was dark, but for numerous small glowing objects here and there. The air was warm and heavy with vapors, especially the esters of alcohol. Put me down. There they are, growled Frankie. His crutches were leaning against the counter. The workshop had indeed become a laboratory. Suspended cupboards had been built over all the countertops. 
They were jammed with jars and instruments with protruding coils and knobs. There was motion everywhere. Tiny flames danced from burners. Colored lights blinked on panels. A group of little pennant-shaped objects spun on needle-thin shafts. On one wall was covered with flat paper wheels like the one Johnny had seen in the black coat's hideout. They turned slowly while pens left squiggly lines. In the far corner, a miniature jag of lightning leapt between two metal rods. Frankie pulled himself up on both crutches. I am tired, Johnny. We'll get you into bed, Bearclaw replied. No, 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 Johnny. I want to talk to Johnny. He maneuvered one crutch to the side and wiped a ball of slobber from his mouth onto his sleeve. Where's your instrument? Your mandolin. The mandolin? Here, in my pack. Give it me. Frankie snatched the mandolin from Johnny's hands and laid it flat on the counter. From an overhead hook, he grabbed a hand drill with a thick iron bit and leveled it over the instrument's tailpiece. Wait! What are you doing? Don't do that! Bearclaw took Johnny's arm and squeezed it. This won't hurt it, said Frankie as he turned the handle and the bit began digging into the wood. Ask Bearclaw. It's a small thing compared to... It's just what people want at the forest, at the fest tonight. <laughs> you will play electric. He handed back the mandolin. Johnny felt shocked, violated. But Bearclaw patted his shoulder. It doesn't matter, he said quietly. It will be all right. Waves, Johnny. Frankie seemed exhausted from the work of drilling. But he thrust himself from the counter and grasped both of Johnny's hands in a vice-like grip. I need to tell you this. You will see this sooner than you know. Waves are everywhere. Sunlight is waves. Sound is waves. Heat, cold. Your thoughts are waves. Every living thing sends out waves. Trees, animals, people. Waves are passing through your body right now as you stand there. Stand there! Frankie pulled himself upright on his crutch. If you stay still, you can feel them. Now, stay still. Stay still. Feel the waves, Johnny. It was an awkward moment. Johnny and Bearclaw stood still with perplexity in their faces while Frankie's body began to sway. His eyes were closed, and he looked like he was going to topple. But then his lids popped open, and he lifted his arms. We can tap into the frequency of a wave, he declared. We can use waves to send messages to distant places. I have done this. Johnny, catch me! Frankie folded in the middle and keeled forward. His crutch rattled to the floor. Both Johnny and Bearclaw rushed to him, but his weight was too great. Bearclaw's knees buckled, and Johnny was knocked off his feet by the momentum of the two stumbling men. A row of beakers flew across the room. Bearclaw hit the floor first, and Johnny rolled the one-legged man sideways to keep the guitarist from being crushed. Frankie moaned. Bearclaw crawled to his knees. Okay, old man, that's it. We're putting you to bed. Wavelength, blubbered Frankie as they dragged him by the arms to the cot on the corner of the laboratory. I found the wavelength, level 17, tonight.
Bearclaw and Johnny stumbled out of Frankie's darkened laboratory into the bright light of morning. They had to squint their eyes. There was color everywhere and buoyant objects drifting on the layers of the air, like, like leaves or, or pages ripped from a book. Bearclaw started to cough. His lungs filled with phlegm and he coughed and coughed until finally he had to squat down on his haunches to stop himself. I don't know, Johnny, he said, standing. I just don't know what's happening anymore. They walked into the meadow, past the stalls and the bright canopies, the jostling, colorfully dressed revelers, the smoky smell of roasting flesh. Johnny could barely take any of this in. He, he tried to slow his thoughts to a pace where he could make words to say something. This, this electric music, what does it sound like? It just sounds like music, only louder. Chestnut hates it. It makes her scream. We haven't tried it untuned yet. Oh, Johnny, I just don't know. Everything is moving so fast. Johnny raked his mind for the pieces of the puzzle. On my road on the way here, he said, I came across a town, abstinence, the abstainers. <sighs> Bearclaw took out a handkerchief and wiped the sweat off his forehead. The abstainers are a crude and ignorant people, he said. I don't shuck any corn with them, but this thing Birdie Man calls progress, it worries me. It worries Frankie, too, but he goes along with it. I think that's why he drinks. He doesn't want, he didn't want the generators. He says, we can make electricity by just blocking up the streams that run down the mountain, and we can send electricity to other towns. But... Birdie Man, hey, I couldn't wait for that. So Frankie had us build the generators. The first night they put electric lights in the log house kitchen, Custer and Brank stayed up all night long making cakes and pies. The next, uh, they were so excited they, they didn't want to stop it. And the next day, Brank came down with a fever from lack of sleep and there were so many pies that nobody knew what to do with them. Chestnut can't sleep with the lights on in the, in the meadow. The owls stop nesting in the hayloft because the balers keep the lights on so they can work late. Frankie told Birdie Man he's gonna make an electric saw that can cut straight boards out of logs. We can build new houses. Birdie Man likes that kind of thing. He wants to build a dome on the top of Round Hill so he can sit up there and watch who's coming on the roads. It's just happening so fast, Johnny. All this in the summer since you were gone. These generators, what fuels them? It's something called black rock. It's a rock that burns. A merchant brought it to Johnny, I mean, I'm sorry, a merchant brought it to Frankie in a wagon in the middle of the night. He brings more from time to time, always in the night. We never met him. Johnny shivered. His memory rolled back over the shadowy forms of things he had seen, from the deep canyons of cities to the hungry mechanical beasts in the mines of Perpetua. In the frayed and splintered towers of Cantankerberg, mad people lived like animals and fed off human flesh. 
while in the streets below children were chained, armed and pitted against each other for money. Money. Nothing could be exchanged without it. He was given money to pay pleasure pain in Ladyland. Mars wanted to trade the boy back to the black coats for money. Because of money, the black coats killed the boy with a gun. The gun which money probably bought. For a moment, Johnny glimpsed a vision of a long chain of cause and effect. He wanted to tell Bearclaw. Words begin to gather and connect. He almost spoke. The place I have been, it may be where you are going. But the opportunity passed. Bearclaw looked up and a smile bloomed on his face. Look, he cried, the cowboys have returned. And there's Jocko. Four small brown cows were standing in front of the barn. There was Climber's bulk and Bird Leg's bones and Birdie Man in his blue robe trying to pry open the mouth of one young beast. <clears throat> but when Jocko saw Johnny, he turned at once and started running toward him, if you could call it running. It was more like a crazy bird dance, his arms flapping like a chicken's wings, his legs wobbling in a heron's waddle, his head bobbing like a mountain jay. Johnny! 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 He sang in a chickadee's warble. And when he arrived, he shoved Johnny so hard on the chest he almost knocked him down. Johnny Arcane, he proclaimed, kill this man. And Bearclaw laughed and laughed. He doesn't mean that. We've just taken down so many posters, it's become his slogan. I heard it first. I heard it so loud we had to stop the music. Didn't we, Bearclaw? Yes, we did, Jocko. We, we, we stopped the music. Let's go find Aunt. Let's tell her Johnny's here. Aunt already knows, but yeah, let's go find her. I, I'm tired of this corn fest already. <sighs> they worked their way back through the gathering crowd. Corn co contests were beginning to form. Leg wrestling, ring toss, hoop jump. Already grown men were carrying steins of beer and young girls were walking arm in arm back at the house. Aunt greeted Bearclaw with a kiss and Jocko with a knuckle on the head. Together at last, she said, and I made muffins. Let's play. So they played. At first, Johnny was bothered by the hole Frankie had made in his turtle box but then he noticed similar holes in Jocko's wash tub, in Ant's fiddle, in Bearclaw's guitar. It didn't seem to affect the sound. They played tuned. They played all the fiddle tunes, and Johnny taught them the few he had learned from Wilbo. They stopped and ate muffins and laughed and told stories about the past. Jocko spoke of the travels of the cowboys, and Ant spoke of the antics of Chestnut. They did not tell stories about the future, and Johnny did not tell stories about the places he had been or the things he had seen. They picked up their instruments and played again. Well, the midday sun crossed the meadow and shone down on the revelers, increasingly sloppy in their cups. And while Frankie Fulcrum slept in his laboratory, dreaming of sounds and moving pictures, streaming toward King Corn on wavelengths from somewhere 
far away.